What I'm going to suggest as a format is this. It's 20 after 11, and we have three panelists and a moderator to take us out and really talk about the practical issues uh, with three levels of government. It's unusual for us to be able to get those folks in a room together, and so I don't want to squander that opportunity. So we're going to take a tight 30 minutes now to hear what came up in your groups and then general comments. Um, the people that moderated those discussion groups, we've asked you if you'd do it from these floor mics. If you'd get to the mic, tell us the group that you were working with and give us the salient points. I'm going to suggest to Jamie and to Cumble that they steal themselves to not try to respond to every point, but kind of keep a running list. And then at the conclusion of that, we'll have some general discussion. That should frame us very nicely for the panel that Dana Borland will, from the uh, JPB Foundation is going to moderate with reps from each of the three levels. I can appreciate that we've only just scratched the surface. And I really uh, uh, can also understand that we've only just, that many of you are a little frustrated that you didn't get more time. Uh, but I think we all understand this is a process that we need lots of time, lots of uh, opportunities to have these kinds of interactions. So this is just the beginning. Um, I'm staring at Vicki Bean, and so I'm wondering, Vicki, if you could come first and report to us uh, from the Built Environment Group and just step in front of Giles, who I'm sure can make room for you. And, um, Take it away. Sure. Take so, um, so we had a, a terrific group of people and uh, and uh, terrific folks from the SIRR um, to talk through some of the issues. And I think we we really identified about um, I want to say seven um, uh, big themes. So the first big theme was the effect of the um, rebuilding and resiliency measures on affordability, and that has several different dimensions. One is that just elevating uh, the mechanicals to, let's say, the first floor usually means that you're taking affordable units in certain buildings off of line, and so that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, in many of these, uh, many of the housing stock that we were talking about, there were often uh, an illegal unit in the basement that now uh, may not be replaced. Um, and so that's going to have an effect on the affordability, uh, on the stock of affordable housing that's available. And more generally, just the need to balance the issues about resiliency with the costs that those measures may impose on uh, building in general, uh, given the, uh, the critically high prices um, that we face in the market already. So really the need to balance those issues, those goals, the goal of, of creating resiliency while also having an affordable housing stock. Um, the second big picture issue was uh, uh, using this opportunity not just to build back to be more resilient, but also to build back to be more climate friendly and more energy efficient. So um, focusing on uh, when we do retrofits, doing things that would make the building more energy efficient, not just because it um, uh, will help reduce climate change, help reduce greenhouse gases, but also because it makes the buildings more resilient. We had people talking about people having to evacuate from buildings that they otherwise could have stayed in just because they became so hot without the air conditioning. Better insulation, more energy efficiency um, would help uh, deal with some of that. The need to allow buildings to be hooked into a grid um, so that passive uh, buildings, buildings that are producing their own energy can, uh, can participate that. Uh, can participate in that, and really a need for sort of a major cultural shift in the way that we think uh, to be more energy efficient and more climate friendly. That was related to a third point, which is really the need for um, better and more coordinated and sort of holistic decision making. There was a concern about are our environmental impact review processes, for example, identifying land that is maybe best used as a sponge uh, for situations like Sandy. So taking our open space, taking uh, land that is now being proposed for development and thinking about the role that it plays as a sponge in, in these kinds of situations. Um, there was a, a call which I thought was uh, really critical for not just thinking about where are we going to keep water out, but where is that water going to go so that we're not um, fixing one person's problem by sending it to another uh, place. So a much more holistic look at, um, uh, at where are we going to absorb the water and where should the, uh, the water go. Um, of course, in any transition, there's a need to deal with 
current proposals. And so uh, there's a question about, well, how does some of the development that is now either underway or being proposed fit in with some of these bigger picture plans? Are we sort of uh, working at cross purposes uh, in, in that way? And so a need for more holistic attention to that. Um, attention to vulnerable populations, not just um, uh, uh, the low-income populations, senior citizens, disabled, et cetera, but also um, vulnerable housing stocks. So the NYCHA housing stock is, of course, one example. Uh, landmark and historic buildings are another that are going to be very hard to, uh, to retrofit. Um, so attention both to the special populations that, uh, that are particularly vulnerable, but also to the particular kinds of housing stock um, that face particular problems in, in retrofitting. Um, there was a call for uh, let's pay attention to the enforcement. We're going to have these new building code uh, provisions. We're going to have a lot of new regulations. How are they going to be enforced? Do we have the capacity to enforce them? Are we training the building inspectors to, uh, you know, to address these new things? Are we educating them about uh, the way in which uh, the enforcement needs to take place? And then finally, of course, there's an issue about uh, finance. How are we going to finance all this? What are new models of finance? How much are we engaging the finance community? Uh, and so those were the big picture themes. Great. So one of the fabulous things about breakout groups is the way that uh, a kind of zeitgeist takes over and you get synergy, even though the groups may have particular topics, you get the same repeated themes. So in my group, a lot of what you talked about was mentioned here. So the challenge to the reporters is that if something's already been raised, you can just say ditto. We talked about it too. You don't need to um, raise it in great detail. So uh, that should mean that as we get further into the reports, they get shorter and more concise, right? Okay, let's try that. Stu, Stuart Pertz, where are you? Next one, Community Rebuilding and Resiliency Plans. Well, I'm going to be much more, much more concise than you can imagine. Go. <clears throat> because, it, because I think that the, the entire session, well, there are two pieces of it. One, I think even in that short period of time, those who didn't read the report and those who read it, like me, got much more out of the conversations from Haley and from Ben. So that that was incredibly useful. But there was one primary theme that, that sort of overwhelmed the hour, and that was the question of community capacity. How do the communities respond? What kind of organizational capabilities is the city supporting in order for the communities to make that happen? And that was a little bit difficult to deal with because that was not, although mentioned in the report, I think the report was re re remarkable in that, in that every line meant something and all the lines were there. It's just that that issue wasn't dealt with. And the answer to, you know, how, does, how do we deal with that was we haven't dealt with it yet. Uh, and so it's, a, it's a, an admonition to the community groups that this is the time to make that kind of thing happen. I made the contrast uh, between the university settlement who was given a contract from the state, from the state mental health, to, to, to help on the Lower East Side compared to other places in the city where there was none of that kind of help in Coney Island, far little help in terms of community uh, capacity. And so there was one after the other. There was some references, just quick ones about, because you keep it in mind that, that there, there, were, there, there is CERT, which in some states is, is extremely effective. It's not effective in New York City at all. It's, a, it's an organization, but it's like a, a club, not an organization of any highly effective nature. Maybe in some pockets, good, but not generally. And there's also the question of there were times when we had air aid wardens, and we had, we had groups that came together that did this kind of thing more naturally than we seem to be doing it now. So it's, a, it's part of the nature of our society, but it's a need that we see much more profound when something like Sandy happens. So it was community building, community capacity building for nonprofits and for, for, for non-agencies that need to be uh, invested in, and there needs to be a method to do that. Great, thanks, Stu. Great. Claire, Claire Weiss, you did the other, the East River communities, right? Okay. Um, yes, and also short, because we won't repeat. So I think that um, in terms of the East River communities, and the discussion really centered very much on gaps, and I'm gonna just go through quickly that some of the gaps were 
pointing out that there's, although, although there's a huge amount of discussion about residential communities being, continuing to be developed in coastal communities that are, are very much in the floodplain, I think there was a question about a gap in a discussion or a clear understanding that could be transferred to the community board and community level about changes in policy. How, uh, how are there, is there, what is the policy shift from one mode to another now that we're looking at a planning that needs to incorporate resiliency? The other gap, uh, there was a lot of discussion in terms of this part of the East River on, and I think it was because of this uh, potent combination of understanding that it both, all, all this waterfront is the lifeblood of our, you know, our economic well-being in New York, both from the corporate office buildings where many people from all over the city have to commute to to work, many companies that were down, many companies who now have to figure out how to create more effective plans for them as tenants or in buildings, to the industrial fabric on the waterfront and how that will be kept going. So I think that the gap was in where in the planning moving to the Office of Long-Term Sustainability, will the on-the-ground technical assistance be able to be conveyed to people both in the workforce and property owners and companies? So I think that there was a sense of it wasn't clear uh, how the gap in really larger-scale education, there was a point made in the group that the marine community, the community that is already on the water has a lot of knowledge and skill that that in terms of a gap needs to be accessed and really there should be a way of accessing that more freely. So the, I, I think the other point uh, that was interesting and really much of the discussion was a dialogue was there was a point made by uh, someone in our group who's from HUD that it, you know, that uh, with the all important issues to do with public and social housing, that there are programs that the state can support, even in terms of, I call it section three, which is job creation in communities that need to be coordinated with federal and city programs in places where revitalization of, of where you're trying to move vulnerable residential populations from basements and allow new kinds of economic activities to happen, all these programs need to find a way to work together. And I think that's, that was basically the gist of the discussion. Great. Great. <laughs> Laura, Laura Starr, can you come and talk to us about coastal stuff? Claire's an easy act to follow because she covers a lot of ground that we covered. Um, we did coastal protection. I had uh, Michael Morilla from City Planning with me and um, Daniel Hitchens from Arcadis. And again, we were talking about how to implement this 400-page study at the community level. The first example that came up was in the Rockaways, where you have the Army Corps building up the beach and the dunes and the Parks Department evidently flattening it right. for recreation, and the community at a loss. and you know, being very upset and really, really feeling impotent in the face of this. So, um, and yet, as Claire was saying, these communities at the waterfront are very, very knowledgeable and they tend to be more coherent. So how do you leverage that and how do you involve them? What, what is the community level structure that takes advantage of that and that also can kind of manage the Army Corps' way of doing things, which, which is very large scale and monolithic, right? We're, we're gonna come in and we're gonna do this and this is the treatment, and yet you've got this finer texture of the community. So, so really, what is the mechanism for bridging that? Um, there's uh, another overlay of this, which is when it comes to the deployable systems, who's going to deploy them, how much operational work does it really take? And Michael brought up this town, Compen, in the Netherlands that the, the team visited, um, where the community comes together and deploys these systems. And having read the book, um, False Flat, where they talk about the Netherlands being the one country in Europe that wasn't futile, they organized always around flood protection for centuries. And the Americans, 
are organized around the individual being successful. And so I think that, you know, like it would be great to become more like the Dutch culturally, but how do we do it? <laughs> no, no seriously, it's, it's a really, really serious question, not just for flood protection, but for managing green infrastructure, who's gonna maintain all the bioswales. Where we're talking about a whole, other level of operations and green jobs in the city and community involvement, and I think that it's a really interesting time culturally, and I'm not sure what the solution is. I'm not a sociologist. Um, we didn't have any in our group either. Uh, so how does this filter into the election cycle was a question. Um, there were questions about the transition from deployable systems to berms and uh, dunes and landforms, what's, what's the design of that? There were some interesting questions about, specifically to Coney Island, we had the Brooklyn Borough President's office planner in our room who asked a lot of good questions. Um, would the Coney Island ferry still get to operate given the, the, the um, floodgate system? That, that is there, we talked about having you know, a multidisciplinary team of, eco of ec economists and engineers and designers studying that. And I would say that's pretty much our summary. Great, Thank thanks, you. Laura. Fantastic. Ruth, Ruth Finkelstein, you did the hospital's healthcare and medicine. Here comes Ruth, down she comes. Thank you. So, uh, we interacted with the obvious a lot in, in our group, but in <laughs> profound ways. Uh, and uh, one of our sort of themes was that uh, communities and people had issues before the storm and that it was challenging to know what they were and have communication and sort of co uh, coherency among the many things that they had needed before with now the additional things that they needed after, which actually peels back the onion on the issue of the coordination between city, state, and federal regulation, which is true in all of these places, but is exceptionally true in the health arena, um, which interacts with uh, sort of competing issues about kind of privacy and confidentiality and need to share information and highlights this ongoing problem where the health, the social services, the preparedness, these worlds, the silos, um, and this is where they meet at the level of the individual and the upshot is that people don't get what they need. Um, and we had a long conversation about um, from uh, sort of direct service providers talking about we need to broaden our lane or do we need to communicate with people in the next lane? But the fact of the matter was that you had people um, in the recovery or in the immediate response phase um, wasting time trying to get people services that could be met someplace else, but they didn't know that and they didn't know how to do that. So that brings us back to the need for better communication about what are the special um, coordinating and sort of um, leniency or disaster regulatory frames that do exist because some new ones need to come into being, but it's also the case that people need to better understand the ones that already exist. Um, uh, let's see, oh, and just to give you a little sort of case in point, so you've got these long-term recovery groups, borough by borough, hospitals aren't involved in them. Go figure. What are the chances that they would be an asset in long-term recovery? <laughs> it seems conceivable, right? Um, so uh, that was a final phase, sort of final theme that came out, which is to remember that the health system is a locus of human capital. 
Obviously, it has very specific jobs and responsibilities in the context of disaster, but it's also the case that it has capacities that turn out not to be needed um, for what they were mobilized for. So there's a need to be able to deploy them in another way. Think of Montefiore, think of the capacity, think of the capacity of Montefiore. It didn't have to do anything in the context of this storm. Think about all the things that, it, that needed to be done that those people could have been helpful in doing, but there wasn't really a way to, um, to, to make that link. Um, uh, well, I'm supposed to sit back. Thanks, I love that I'm, I want to talk about my day having been interacted with the obvious but in profound ways. I'd like to report that every day. Okay, Denise Hoffman Branch, you're going to do utilities. Where are you, Denise? Here she comes. Uh, well, much of our discussion actually revolved around the kind of complex uh, dance between the city and the major utility vendors, uh, purveyors. And I have to say that although our session was to cover waste and water, uh, electricity and telecom, we really spent the hour on electricity and a few minutes on telecom and no time on waste and water, unfortunately. Um, the discussion was actually launched with a question about microgrids and distributed energy systems. And this was a kind of constant theme throughout the discussion. Um, key points being, you know, how to make Con Ed more accountable where it is uh, providing uh, major significant population hubs and how to establish clear mechanisms for their accountability. Um, and particularly in light of city investment in facility protection uh, and Con Ed's commensurate proposal to raise the rates for that same protection. So where can the city actually use the fact that it's working to shore up Con Ed's equipment in a more holistic way and leverage alternatives like better partnerships for microgrids and distributed systems, not to mention uh, alternative fuels, which I would say was another leitmotif throughout the discussion was how can we start to leverage alternative fuel sources in a meaningful way. Uh, getting the uh, major plants out of the floodplain was obviously an issue. Um, partnering on microgrids was one approach, but also it was mentioned that there was a 2006 assessment that there's not uh, a lot of places within the city to relocate uh, large plants, and so that then again turned the discussion back to microgrids. But given that Con Ed is unlikely to want to uh, participate, in uh, the economics of that because it takes away their uh, income capacity, their distributors, not generators so much anymore. Uh, the pilot projects that are set up, the competition processes need to be clearly framed and communicated on what their mission is. And this was something that somebody called out that they thought the SIRR report needed to more effectively describe what the mission was and where the implementation money was gonna be coming from. Um, so ultimately, and this is where telecom came in, there's an idea that the city plan could incentivize and guide the utilities to develop new business models as they trans become more uh, distributors than generators. And by doing this, we could start to have a more distributed and effective uh, utility system. Hmm. Great, thank you. Mr. Grid. Great. Last, last, second to last, because my the implementation group will be last. Joan, you, transportation and parks. Um, okay, picking up on the the zeitgeist that um, was talked about with coastal protection, uh, and how we develop a culture citywide of people acting collectively and proactively. Transportation is important in that because no matter where you lived or work in New York City, you were impacted by the fact that the transportation system, the subway system, shut down. So. Even if your power stayed on, even if your house stayed dry, that was the way you were impacted. And we think that the need for what the report calls an emergency planning exercise that would be conducted between the agencies, presumably not only DOT, but also MTA, importantly NYPD, the, Raising the profile of that, making that also a public exercise, is something that's going to help keep top of people's minds citywide the potential for disruption and the need to respond in collective and creative ways. Um, specifically, 
uh, a couple, couple of the infrastructure things that would help. The momentum to expand select bus service needs to be maintained and accelerated. We realize there's some political obstacles to that. More than anything else, it's about the allocation of lane space. We feel like, again, raising consciousness is going to help. Having buses cross the bridges in normal times will make it easier to reallocate lanes on bridges during times of disruption. So having SBS be a network that reaches across bridges will serve us in bad times and in good times. Select bus service and also ferries can certainly fill gaps in areas that are badly underserved by the transportation network now. Uh, Rockaway obviously is the poster child for that. People have welcomed that ferry service so much. What does it take to mainstream ferry transportation as part of the transit system? We realize there are capacity issues, there are subsidy issues and issues of equity that are probably solvable and need to be grappled with for that to happen. We think that we, we shouldn't walk away from the idea that ferries can be mainstreamed rather than simply be concession contracts that come and go that, you know, that people cannot rely on year in and year out. Um, the need for interagency coordination at every level um, not only, you know, in what happens during a disaster, in what happens to set up infrastructure to be better able to respond to disaster, uh, and even in things like the deployment of the barriers. Um, it was mentioned that bike and pedestrian transportation was essential. People walked more than they ever walked in their lives in the days and weeks after Sandy, and yet, Walking and biking was harder because a lot of the routes that people would normally be able to use and count on were disrupted themselves. That people used the Hudson River Greenway as a staging area for every kind of road construction project. There has to be a different mentality and a different kind of top down management of that asset and other greenway assets as transportation. There was a concern that deployable barriers might compromise waterfront greenways that people really use as transportation routes. Obviously, you can do protective measures that enhance the functionality of those routes rather than undermines them, but that's got to be in the mix. Um, I think that's it. Great. Great. Okay, um, my group was the uh, implementation group, and uh, as I suggested, a lot of the things that you uh, talked about in the other groups, we touched on too. We had sort of five key points. Integration. Where's the state in all this? And I know they're in the room, so we're going to hear about it. Um, where, where is the regional impact? What about unexpected consequences when we do something for the city? Is it going to affect the region in a negative way? Scope. What about the pre-existing conditions? A group already mentioned this. They don't seem to be addressed in the report. Communications need for a massive public education emphasis, and we don't see that in the report. We're wondering who's taken that on. Fourth one, financial scenarios. What about a downturn? What about if the $20 billion isn't around? What are we going to do? And then the fifth was we need on-the-ground action now. In this room, lots of smart folks doing smart things could be implemented immediately. We don't have to wait for $20 billion. bucks. Is there some way to scale that up and get it happening? That was the implementation group. Do you want to comment for a few minutes about what you've heard, and then we'll go to the next session? Go. <laughs> I think I'll just say that I, mean, I think it, it underscores why these kind of sessions are so important because as much work as the team collectively and the city uh, actors involved and the, the army of consultants and other outside advisors have done, there's still a host of issues that, that need to be explored further and that are only possible through this kind of dialogue. So this is a blueprint, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, or maybe mixed metaphors, a lot of meat that needs to be put on the bones. And I think this conversation is, a, again, a good part of that process. So there's no way we can fully address all the things that sure. were raised, but I think this is a, a good and a healthy and a necessary discussion to really make this a, a living plan, a living activity as opposed to just a, a plan on paper. Yeah, um, cer certainly true. I, I, m I might just make a couple um, quick points. I mean, one, one, of the, one of the problems is it's a very dense report. There's a lot in there, so sometimes it's just a matter of pointing out things that are in there that people haven't uh, caught yet. Um, but I, I, I think one of the things I hear running throughout the comments um, is an acknowledgement that there's a need for real innovation in the field of resiliency. Um, and I, you know, I, th I think that's really true and we can't emphasize it enough. I mean, this is in, in so many ways, and Takumbo really summarized that in terms of talking about what happened during Sandy and the future risks. Um, 
in the urban context, this is a new way of approaching these problems that we have to get increasingly good at. Um, and so, you know, throughout the recommendations, there are uh, ways of trying to stimulate innovation in this field. Um, a competition uh, that the city's announced to develop resilient technologies that would support adaptation of housing and commercial stock. A competition to try and uh, figure out how to both adapt and in some cases rebuild uh, housing on small lots and in uh, bungalow contexts, um, including uh, potentially using modular housing technology to do that and deploy that. Uh, thinking about uh, resiliency of some of the areas that are most vulnerable to regular tidal flooding, including Broad Channel uh, within Jamaica Bay. Um, there's a competition that the city is co-sponsoring right now with the designated developer of the Arvern East property to rethink the way that that um, uh, development project works. Um, and then there's a set of RFEIs and RFPs that are contemplated uh, in the report to try and bring more activity and, and uh, resilient uh, development. Uh, as well as a competition to think about um, repositioning the plazas and arcades of Water Street here in Lower Manhattan. So there's a real, I mean, that's just, you know, skimming the surface. I mean, there's a real need for innovation. Um, the second point I'd respond to, j just because I, I heard it, um, uh, is um, just thinking about development in, uh, on, in the coastal areas and in the floodplain. Um, and, and I think, again, in case it wasn't caught, there is uh, a very substantial effort that the Department of City Planning intends to lead, much of which is going to start this year, uh, to do some very comprehensive thinking about communities that have been impacted in different ways. Um, and there's a, there's a list of communities, uh, again, skimming the surface of the communities that need to be uh, thought through, but ways that we can look at those communities and think about how to foster resilient adaptation, and in some cases, redevelopment. And, you know, I, I think it's, I, I don't think there's one solution. I think the point about development versus coastal protection, renaturalization, is an important one. Um, uh, you know, Tacumbo summarized uh, in, in the opening remarks uh, that in many cases, new development can prove to be the most resilient thing that you can do uh, within the floodplain because uh, if it's built according to code, uh, it, it, you know, it tends to be elevated and it, it tends to provide a, a significant amount of flood protection. So I, I think you know, that's one perspective. There needs to be a lot of study and debate on this. The last point that I'd respond to um, is uh, here in the group that I sat in and I heard it in a couple of the report backs, um, the, the need for community capacity. Um, and I think that that's a very important point, which again, the administration will be able to do to launch some significant initiatives on, um, uh, but probably not be able to solve all of the, the problems and challenges. Um, but you know, I think it breaks into two different areas. One has to do with education and preparedness. Um, there are a set of recommendations in here about piloting ways of increasing local capacity and improving the the, um, uh, the, the team, the response teams that are organized under the Office of Emergency Management. Um, also, uh, many of you would have seen that the mayor uh, announced the uh, um, uh, sort of overhaul to the evacuation zone system, which I think people will pay a lot more attention to now, um, having been caught by Sandy in many cases. Um, so I think there's a lot there in terms of information. And the other aspect of this is the capacity to respond um, uh, and, and, you know, and the understanding that it will get more expensive to live in coastal areas um, worldwide, but certainly in New York City. And so um, we've tried to be very focused on measures that will enhance the economic capacity of communities to respond. Um, there's a lot in there. Again, you know, some of these problems are very difficult and have been our pre-existing conditions. Um, they've been around for a long time, but there's a real attempt to focus in on some of those issues. I just think the final thing I would note is that I think that the, the point that Jamie made about building community capacity, it's very important to remember that it's not just in the communities that are impacted this time. Again, it's not about fighting the last war. And I know there's a woman here from, from East Harlem. There are neighborhoods in the city. Harlem, sorry. Uh, uh, certainly East Harlem is an area that's in the, in the floodplain, so there are parts of the city that were not impacted, so thinking ahead to capacity building and deploying technologies and all these things need to be employed uh, across the city, not just in the areas that are impacted. I mean, the need is most immediate, but we have to, again, be cognizant of the fact that th there are many parts of the city that are at risk. This really is a way of thinking, changing the way we think about uh, development and uh, planning for the city as a whole. And that's, I think, a really important concept right. to take away from all this. This is really something which needs to become part of the city's DNA for planning broad, uh, writ large. 
So while we make the transition to uh, the next session, I'm going to ask Ariel Marin to come up and talk about briefly about community innovation and Sandy success stories. Come on up. Would you thank Jamie and Tacombo for me for spending the morning? Thank you. Hi everybody. I'm Ariella Marin, and um, uh, a, a useful um, uh, separation of time so that the panels can move out. But I'm here for a really important reason. At least I think it's very important. Um, I was asked on behalf of a variety, a subset of the civic and environmental groups here in New York City to, to bring folks together and start thinking about what the future of sustainability looks like in New York City. It's a subset of about 12 of the organizations listed here. I apologize, the, the animation and, and slide pieces fell off a bit. Um, so with this organization, these groups of organizations, we were coming together thinking the future of sustainability in New York City. And after Sandy hit, we came together. And like everyone else in the region, we were you know, devastated by, by what we saw. And we're trying to figure out you know, what we can do to help figure out how we can avoid this type of devastation moving forward. And all of the elected officials on every level of government who are all joining us up here right now, hello, on the city, state, and, and federal level, all rushed and quickly said, we're going to rebuild and we're going to do so smarter and we're going to make our communities more resilient. And, and they're all here to talk about that. But in parallel, many of the civic organizations in the city, some of whom started their own planning efforts and design guidelines and others, still wanted to see how we collectively, as a civic group of organizations, can make sure that our elected elected officials and their representatives make thoughtful decisions, and not just those who are in office now, but also those who will be in office maybe in six months from now and in a couple of years from now and, and moving forward. So as we came together and discussed how to do this, uh, we started to learn about case studies of things that already went right uh, during Superstorm Sandy. And we started what we are now calling Sandy Success Stories, which is up here. Um, for Sandy success stories to become a reality, we just started to talk to a lot of people. We spoke to building owners, we spoke to community organizations, we spoke to developers, communities, as I mentioned, um, but we also started speaking to a lot of the same um, experts that many of the folks who worked on the city's plan and other plans are talking about energy infrastructure experts, green infrastructure experts, and, and others. And what we found was that actually there was a lot of stuff that did go right during Sandy, and everybody was really excited to share their stories with us about what went right for their particular site. They took pictures, they gave us tours, they wrote white papers, because so many people want to be part of the narrative of, of not just what went wrong and how we, we build more strongly, but also that we've actually have started to already transition our built environment in New York City in the region to be more resilient. And granted, it's, it's on a small scale. There's obviously a lot of work to do. As you could see, the size of the SIR book, there's a lot more to do. But, um, but the purpose of these studies and the purpose for releasing them now is to show that while there is a lot to do, and, and yes, as Jamie said, there's a need for innovation, there's a lot of things we already know how to do. And as, as scary as it might be seeing these $20 billion figures and, and all these big plans, there's a lot of small things we could do on the micro scale that are already working. And these case studies um, hope to show that. And we think of this report, which you can find at sandysuccessstories.org, is just the beginning of this conversation. You could go there. You could also go to the Sandy Success Stories Facebook and start sharing your ideas. Because what we would like to do is build this community of folks who are thinking about the things that we can do right now that will help guide you know, the next mayoral administration and the implementation of some of these plans, but also the work that has to be done on developer level and community level. Because uh, the SIRR was just one report. You're going to hear about others, but we also had Urban Green Council's report came out, city planning design guidelines, all, everyone's almost being inundated with everything we have to do. And, and what's good to know is that it's not all so scary, that we actually know a lot of what has to be done. We just need to keep pushing on that together. So I encourage you to follow us on San, uh, Sandy Successors on Facebook, check out the website, and thank you to all of you in the room and outside who helped participate in this effort. As you can see from the previous list, there are many people involved, and we hope this is the start. So thank you for the time. All right, so now the, the moment has come where the rubber hits the road. I, I, we've decided that to be involved in resilience work in New York, your name has to be Seth or Jamie. 
uh, but we're going to make room for Dana, uh, which is terrific to have a Dana in the midst. Um, we've had a full morning here, ladies and gentlemen, lady and gentlemen. Uh, we we want to have more time together, but we're really eager to hear from you uh, as you respond practically to what the next sets of, step are, set, sets of steps are. So would you welcome, please, Seth Pinsky, Seth Diamond, Jamie Rubin, and Dana Borland. Terrific. It has been a, a, just a fabulous uh, morning for me, who has been less involved with this process, although I, I have read the report. Um, but we're really just going to jump in right now. I think my role is going to be less of moderator and one of timekeeper, because uh, we are going to have at least, I hope, 10 to 15 minutes to just open it up for, for some more conversation. Um, and I think you know one of the issues when you write such a great report and answer the question you are given, then everyone wants to talk about and discuss um, what wasn't in the report. And I think there's been some consensus today around uh, the people, the human resilience, and how do we have a conversation about that. So to the best of your ability, the three of you, if you're able maybe to address uh, some of that, how are we actually going to synergize some of these community-based organizations, build local capacity, um, but really I think what's pressing on our minds also is what is that handoff going to be? What is the, the future coordination going to be across the entities that have been involved um, so far. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Seth, and if I, I mean, uh, Jamie, and if I stand up, that means you're out of time. Um, why don't I, yeah. My picture is here, but it's not, oh, it is up there. Um, <laughs> can I click away from that? So um, I'm going to be very brief. Um, I didn't do all the work to get the SIR report out. Um, and so I don't get to spend a lot of time up here talking about the SIR report. Um, just a couple of things quickly, and um, I will, um, I'll touch on a couple of the questions that you asked, Dana, but also I think we'll probably in the conversation we'll get to those as well. Um, so a few things. First of all, I'm not going to talk about why my name is not Seth. Um, there's not really any good answer for that. Um, second of all, obviously congratulations to Seth Pinsky and his team. I see a number of them here. We've worked closely with them. Um, I should say I'm the New York State Director of the Federal Task Force, and we have been working closely with Seth and Mark and their entire team, Tacumbo and, uh, anyway, all those guys. Um, uh, since we hit the ground and they hit the ground, um, we have certainly weekly and sometimes daily interactions. It's extraordinary the amount of work that they did. Um, and the scope and breadth and I think in some cases weight of the, um, of the work product that they created. I think it really is, um, uh, it's extraordinary. And we were with, um, I can tell you, we were with Sean Donovan, who is the HUD secretary, well known to everybody in this room, um, and the chairman of my task force. Um, the day, uh, I was with him the day it came out. Um, I had the chance to talk to him about it some, and I know that he is um, uh, grateful for the work and also impressed with the depth of it. And he's had the opportunity to talk to your team. Um, over time as well. So, well done. Um, uh, Seth, congratulations on being appointed to um, your new job, which you'll, I'm sure, talk about. Um, Seth is in his third day, so obviously is fully immersed in his everything um, disaster. So I would encourage you to direct most of your toughest questions to Seth um, Diamond. And, um, and then lastly, Dana, it's nice to meet you. Um, obviously, you come to this with, um, with a lot of excellent background. And of course, thank you to the MAS and to the New School for hosting us. So a couple of things quickly. Um, one on the, our job at the task force. Not, I'm not going to talk about the task force much here, but just a couple of quick sort of um, logistical notes. Our report is due to the president on August 2nd. Um, I actually can't tell you what that means in terms of public, um, uh, uh, sort of public availability of it. I assume that once it's the president's, it's yours as well. Um, so you have that to look forward to. Um, that's a Friday, so you might have to wait till Monday to get it. Um, it's not going to look much like the SIR report. We've taken a different approach, which is just obviously we're federal. Um, we are staying at, I would call, a higher level for the most part. Um, so there'll be some of the sort of background work but um, that the SIR folks engaged in, but very little of it. We'll certainly reference theirs in the 2100 report that the Governor's Commission did and, and other reports as Ariel so that, have, that have come up along the way. But much more, we're, um, we are taking advantage of the fact that we are, of the time that we're going to be coming out. So we will be coming out, um, you know, the federal government obviously plays a central role in the recovery. We're going to take advantage of the fact that um, we are going to be, what, six months or seven months into the recovery period. We'll have the opportunity to look back some at what's gone on 
uh, and then look forward at what should come, and then also way forward into when, the, or maybe not that way forward, into what the next disaster is going to look like, and in particular what the federal role, major disaster, what the federal role will look like uh, in that. And we will be um, tying some of what we've seen happen so far in this region to what we think should happen going forward. So we're going to make a number of very, very specific policy recommendations, largely around federal policy issues, um, uh, that are that draw on the lessons of Sandy. So it's a you know it's for the federal government a relatively real time and and I hope quite relevant piece of work. And importantly, what we've done is and, and this was Sean Donovan instructed us to do this is tie everything we recommend to an action. So we're, this is, this shouldn't be uh, very much sort of abstract policy making. There's going to be some very specific and concrete commitments by the federal government, specific agencies and sub agencies of the federal government to do things, uh, both in the Sandy recovery as it goes forward and in future disasters. So hopefully it'll be. Um, it should be quite a useful piece of work, I think. Um, we don't have any artist renderings that I'm aware of yet. Um, so a couple of quick reflections from our time on the ground here um, and tying into uh, the work that Seth Pinsky's group did. One, um, I am new to this work. I come from the private sector, but so maybe this is, you can chalk it up to, um, uh, I don't know, uh, youthful naivete or something, but I'm quite optimistic about, based on what we've seen so far. We've been working for eight months, um, starting really right after Sandy. Um, and I am happy to report that at least our experience has been that there's been an unprecedented, I'm told, and um, really very high level, objectively, level of cooperation between the various levels of government. And what I mean by that is we obviously we're the federal government. You have on the stage the state, uh, the state uh, and the city. And then, of course, we also work um, out on Long Island, for example, where there's all kinds of local government involved. Um, there has been a... Uh, a very high level, much higher than I had expected, level of coordination and collaboration between the various levels. And it pops out in places that you probably wouldn't, um, you know, are, are not really generally publicly um, acknowledged, but they're in, largely in things that happen faster or better than they might otherwise have happened. And I could give you chapter and verse if we were sitting together, I won't, but I can tell you in a couple of issues, for example, um, insurance is one. Seth will talk, and his report talked a lot about the issue of National Flood Insurance Program. Um, that is a federal program for the most part, and we have worked very closely with both the state and the city to figure out what it is that's wrong with the program, and there's a lot wrong with the program now, um, and come up with some, I think, some interesting um, uh, potential resolutions um, and improvements in the program going forward, and that's drawn very heavily on work that the state and the city have done, as well as outside actors that in particular the city drew in. Um, and I think there's a pretty high level of um, of agreement on what uh, what should be what should happen going forward, and there's a, a new number of other issues. Obviously, it's imperfect. There are places where there's friction or a lack of interaction, but I think relative to what you would expect, it's actually been um, uh, been terrific. Second of all, resilience is obviously a term that is thrown around a lot um, in the recovery. Um, I think that uh, we've done all of us have done a lot to start to make resilience something that's real as part of the recovery. Um, and one obvious example, and I will um, again brag on my boss. Um, in early April, Secretary Donovan and Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood announced a minimum flood risk standard to protect federal uh, investments in the Sandy-affected communities. Um, this was colloquially known as ABFE plus one, and it required that all major rebuilding projects that rely on Sandy-related federal funding elevate or otherwise flood-proof the project according to the most recent FEMA guidance plus one additional foot. An important thing to do, very um, uh, sort of technical in nature, but I think will have su substantial impact going forward in this disaster and in the future. But most importantly, in some ways, it was a concrete recognition by the federal government that climate change has real impact and needs uh, adjustment um, uh, in our policies in order to take advantage, take account of it. And um, I am, I've been told that I'm not supposed to say this, but I will say it is that the first time, it's the first time that the federal government has made that kind of statement and tying it to a specific policy. Um, uh, and I think in that, in that regard, very important, and obviously that's all about resilience. Third, um, the disaster was regional in nature. Sean, again, um, and both the governor and the mayor um, have uh, talked often about the need for regional coordination. Um, I don't want to steal my own thunder, so in our August report you will see that we do a number of things that are, um, quote, regional in nature. We have some regional convening that we're going to be doing um, to make sure uh, that um, federal investment is done with, an, with, a, um, with more than just the exact area that the investment is made in mind. So an example that we often talk about is when the first meeting that we had uh, with the secretary here in New York City after Sandy was a meeting with all the heads of the regional transportation agencies, the MTA, um, the Port Authority, Amtrak, LIR, et cetera. And we talked about what, they had ha what had happened in Sandy and what they saw going forward. And um, 
each of them had their own example of something that either was done or wasn't done um, that had an impact on another agency at the same time. And so one example is um, uh, one of the agencies had decided not to close off their tunnels because had they closed off their tunnels, um, uh, the water would have obviously been blocked and gone and run into somebody else's rail yard. Well, that had a huge impact on, the, simple as it is, had a huge impact on the way that we, Sean and, and the task force, have approached our work. And we've taken this notion of the importance of regional interdependency and blown it out. And you will see um, in the work that comes out on August 2nd how seriously we've taken uh, the idea that, um, that federal dollars have impacts not only where they're invested, but in everything around where they're invested. So. Um, let me stop there. Again, I'll say we're, we're quite optimistic about coordination going forward. Um, we're quite optimistic that the notion of resilience is starting to take on a concrete meaning in federal dollars. Um, and we are quite optimistic that, um, that we can uh, use the federal role to drive a level of regional coordination that perhaps wasn't uh, in place before. And I'm looking forward to talking more with my colleagues. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and we're going to have Seth Diamond come up. But if your microphone's working, Jamie, can you, um, maybe while he's coming up, can you just maybe help us understand in the audience, you know, working locally here um, and in New York, how to stay engaged or what we could do uh, to support the work that's going on at the federal level? What do you expect from us? Sure. Um, let's see. Does that work, sort of? Yeah. Great. Um, so good question. We've actually done, um, we haven't done the same level of community engagement that, uh, that the SUR team has. I know they were um, you know, deeply committed to it. We are also deeply committed to it, but we have, it's the federal government, we just have a sort of a different approach to it. So what we've done is, um, looking backwards, we've convened a number of roundtables with, um, uh, organized by issue, um, with, um, you know, in order to get the advice of folks who, from the various issue communities. And, and they haven't been particularly broadly spread. They've been here and in New Jersey and other parts of the, um, the affected region. So that's something we're continuing to do. Um, and I know I see some familiar faces. I know Eddie Batista and others have been in some of these. Um, we're going to con continue to do that going forward. So obviously, if asked, it would be great if you would participate. Um, that is, I'll spare you the gory details, but our report goes into what's called the concurrence process uh, next week, which means the other agencies in the federal government start to look at it, um, which means that effectively we're pencils down at that point, and um, our July is going to be taken up largely with doing a lot more of that kind of engagement. So I would say, again, you know, the experts are in the room, uh, in this room and others like it, to the extent that um, you'd be willing to talk to us about very specific policy recommendations that we're doing, that we're making, and we can start to share those with you over time. Uh, that's really number one. Thanks. Okay, thank you, and a good, I guess good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. This is my initial foray into this area, so um, I'm excited to be here, and hopefully I'll uh, say, if not the right thing, at least not the wrong thing. Um, as Jamie said, it is my, my third day, so a minute for every day I've been here, and I'd still probably come in under time. But um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, resilience, and I'm less familiar with a lot of the physical resilience efforts, but very familiar with the human resilience. I, uh, before I came to this job, among the things I did for the city was oversee the city's evacuation program throughout Sandy, which continues in some elements, <coughs> excuse me, until today. And there I know many of you were involved in uh, dealing with the human uh, efforts to get people services and support um, in both the initial days after the storm and continuing till today. And it was always tremendously inspiring both to see the people who had lost everything and how their efforts to bounce back uh, and how we could support them in the city, how important that was to, to the getting back on their, their feet and how creative and inspirational it was to have so many organizations embrace them and help people with all kinds of things, some of which uh, the government was doing or was in the process of doing, but some of which uh, we needed more quickly than we could provide. And so working together, it was just tremendously inspiring. And I bring that spirit of human resilience and cooperation to this job. Um, a couple of things that I, I've heard this morning, I was here earlier and listened to some of the breakout groups, which are certainly themes that the state wants to bring to the work. Um, one is the uh, integration, and it's um, first geographic integration. Uh, the storm certainly knew no boundaries, and so much, uh, as everyone has said, that happens in the city and the region is interdependent. And so 
We look forward very much to supporting the city and working very closely with the city on the implementation of its really very excellent report. And the state has a specific role on some items, the transportation through the MTA and some other areas which are on directly under, more directly under state control. But all the areas work so closely together. And in fact, what happens in one part of the region directly impacts the other. And so we do want to work very closely. I had the privilege of working for the city for 20 years before coming to this role. And so I'm very hopeful that I can continue to work well uh, and will work well with my city partners and um, have also worked closely just in the past weeks with Jamie and getting to know the federal role. So I think uh, we're well positioned to have a good coordinated effort. But beyond the sort of governmental integration, um, the program integration and the importance of making sure all the kinds of efforts that go forward support each other and just how broad the effort really needs to be if you're going to address the true problems. I worked in social services in the city in both food stamps and welfare and homelessness. And uh, we always felt in social services that you couldn't solve social services just with social services. You needed economic development, you needed housing, you needed a whole range of services if you were really going to solve the issues. And in some senses, this is very similar. You can't just look at building stronger buildings or hardening uh, power plants. You have to look at, as, as we were saying before, economic development and getting people better jobs and working on community issues and communications and really a full range of issues if you're going to have uh, a good response. There's obviously some tension between trying to do everything and looking at the problem so broadly that you end up with nothing and making sure that um, you properly integrate. But um, one of the challenges, I think, is making sure that our focus is broad enough to encompass the things that we do, but focused enough that we have a real good game plan to go forward. And I'm uh, anxious to do that. The other theme that um, is very important to the governor and to the state is the community input process. Uh, many of you are familiar with the re community recovery zones, which are 43 uh, zones throughout the state where uh, each will have its own budget and its own process for getting community input on resiliency projects. And the state is going to be identifying leads and boards in each area, as well as giving them really top quality assistance from uh, agencies and uh, private sector firms that are involved have been involved in resiliency and planning efforts going forward. And that, there, that's going to be a formal mechanism to listen to communities to make sure that the priorities that they're expressing are reflected in the state's planning and to giving them a real substantial voice in the efforts that will be going forward. Um, I can talk more about that later if there's interest or if you haven't heard, but th that is really at the beginning of the process. This is not something that is pre-cooked or that there's a, a plan that's waiting on a back shelf and this, it's, um, the effort is really just to cover what's already been determined. This is a real honest community input effort that will be rolling out over the summer and into the fall in the city and in some of the upstate communities that were impacted not by Sandy but by uh, Irene and Lee. And it will be a real effort again to solicit community input to make sure that the priorities that we're putting forward in the state reflect the community desires and input and knowledge. Um, and beyond the uh, community input in that formal way, I want to say what Jamie said, which is I, I look forward to working with all of you to get your input. Um, one of the things I've always had tried to do, whatever job I have been in is make sure that I'm listening to people who are really involved, who are on the ground, who know the work, who have perspectives that may or may not be my own, but are very valuable and important to hear. And so I want to hear all of you. You have been deeply involved, emotionally involved in this work for a long time. And uh, we want to tap into that rich knowledge, experience, and commitment to making this city and state better. And I look forward to hearing from you, to working with you, and to moving forward together. Thank you very much. I'm doing a terrible job keeping us on time, but I uh, don't want to cut any of you off. So, Seth, uh, you'll have as much time as you need to close us out, and then I'm assuming we'll have a few minutes to keep going for those that, that can stay. Seth Diamond, uh, just real quickly, so is there a website, or how would we track that community engagement process that's just beginning? Yeah, it's... it's it, uh, we just... 
Is this working? Yes. Okay. Um, it's, it's at the beginning stages uh, in that the communities have been identified. Um, again, there are 43 of them. If you go to the state's website, the communities and the budgets for each are laid out. They're, they range from a minimum of $3 million to I think $25 million or $30 million is the highest. And so you can see which community and what the budget is for each. We are in the process of uh, hiring people to work with each community, both um, to be community liaisons and also to, there was a, a you know, solicitation for interest and contracts for agencies to work, um, who have experience in this area to work with each community. So that's ongoing. And then over the summer, you'll hear much more about who's on each board and, and what the more formal process is going to be. Great. Uh, is that the name? The Community Recovery Zones is the project, is the overall name of the project. I'm not exactly sure where you can find that on the state website. I, I'm, if you probably put that in, that would probably be enough, but I can certainly get that information now. Well, I'm sure Courtney can send that around to everyone. Um, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, this morning slash afternoon. Um, I see a number of my colleagues and I came in uh, towards the end of uh, the earlier discussion. And so I think that there's been a fair amount of conversation about some of the initiatives that are proposed um, through the, the mayor's special initiative for rebuilding and res uh, resiliency. Um, so what I wanted to do uh, very quickly was just to focus on, on two parts of the report um, that I think because of the initiatives um, may be getting less attention, but I think are, are very important because they help to frame what the questions are that we're trying to answer. Um, and the way that we've organized the report um, is based on three questions that the mayor asked of us. One was what happened during Sandy and why. Two was um, what are our vulnerabilities going forward given climate change and three, what do we do about it? Um, and as I said, I think there's been a lot of focus on question number three. I want to just move backwards to questions one and two, and, and I'll do this in, in literally 30 seconds for each. Um, I think what is really important that we took from our analysis of what happened during Hurricane Sandy is that the conditions that came together to create Hurricane Sandy were highly idiosyncratic. Um, and as a result of that, the chances of another Sandy happening in exactly the same way with exactly the same impacts, though certainly not impossible, are at least remote. Um, and therefore, the lesson that we take from that um, is that it's not really about preparing for the next Sandy. Instead, what it's about is one, of course, making sure that we repair the damage that was done to people's lives, to businesses, to communities uh, as a result of the hurricane. But two, and, and this is equally important, we need to use Sandy as a harbinger of a type of risk that we face as we look to the future. Um, and so that's then uh, a good segue into the, the second part of um, the report and the answer to the second question that the mayor ans uh, asked, which is, so what are those risks that we face? And a lot of people have focused on uh, the damage that Sandy did. A lot of people have focused on FEMA's new flood maps, uh, the latest interim version of which were released uh, for New York City uh, very recently. And all of that is very, very important. But I think it's also critically important for us to realize that climate change is about much more than just coastal storms. It's not just about Sandy, but it's also not just about coastal storms and hurricanes. It's about the whole range of potential impacts that climate change might have on the environment, whether it's sea level rise and the impact that that will have even without the effects of storms. Our uh, modeling shows that by the mid-2050s, it's possible that almost 10% of the coastline of the city will be subject to re uh, regular tidal flooding, uh, even without any storm condition at all. It's also about things like heat waves. And actually, heat waves kill more people in the United States every year than any other natural phenomenon. And our report indicates that by the middle of the century, we could have the same number of days on average uh, above 90 degrees here in New York City as Birmingham, Alabama does today. So very serious consequences that we're looking at. Um, so uh, I, I think that. Uh, what that does is then helps us to frame how we approach the solutions. And um, as you heard earlier, 
Um, the solutions are about much more than coastal flooding, and they are about much more than protecting just the areas that happen to have been impacted um, by this storm. And, and because you've spoken a lot about them earlier, or heard a lot about them earlier, I, I won't go into detail on those, although I'm happy to talk about them. I guess what I would just conclude with is um, an answer to, to two of the questions that, that Dana asked at the beginning. Um, one is this question of um, intergovernmental coordination. And I just want to, uh, I guess not second, but third, uh, what uh, Seth and uh, Jamie said, the, the level of coordination between the various levels of government um, post Sandy has really been extraordinary. Um, and I've now been involved in city government not for 20 years, but for 10 years. Um, and I can tell you that um, that's not always the case. Um, and it, it really is the case here. Um, and having Seth now a uh, former colleague um, and a good friend on uh, board on the state side and uh, the great work of the task force that Jamie's been heading up uh, here in New York State and that Secretary Donovan has been heading up for the region, um, there, we, we really speak to each other frequently. We bounce ideas off of each other. Where there are um, areas of contention, and, and there certainly are, um, we work together to try to address them, to try to make sure that, um, uh, that we can coordinate our approaches. So um, my hope is that that will continue going forward, and my expectation is that that will continue going forward. The second question uh, that Dana uh, led with was the question about communities. And I would say that communities have been an important part of our process um, at the city level in three different ways. First of all, um, as we've been putting together this report, um, engaging with elected officials. Uh, we met with um, uh, the offices of over 65 different elected officials, uh, almost 20 community boards across the city, uh, engaging with community organizations. Uh, we were regularly meeting with over 300 different community organizations from across the, the five boroughs, and talking to the general public, um, holding public sessions that over 1,000 New Yorkers attended not just to be able to tell them what we were thinking, although we did that and, and the reactions certainly were useful, but also to listen and to try to hear uh, what they thought the right solutions were. Um, that was a critical part of our process. And I can tell you that some of what I think um, are the most important initiatives that we have came out of that process. The second way in which communities have played a role um, is that in our report, we talk about um, how we as city government can help build capacity. Um, and there's a little bit of irony, I guess, um, uh, in the, the notion of a government-sponsored uh, development of the grassroots. Um, and so we try not to be too heavy-handed about that, but there are certainly um, proposals in the report that talks about how we might be able to assist um, the strengthening of those grassroots, because we know um, that grassroots organizations played a really critical role, um, not just in the uh, response to the storm, but also have continued to do so during the recovery. And then the, the third way in which communities play a role in our plan um, is in implementation. Um, and um, there are really two angles to this. Um, one is that almost everything that we propose, not, not quite everything, but almost everything that we propose is going to go through some sort of public process. And our expectation is that as these initiatives go through those public processes that we will be getting additional feedback from communities um, and we will be making adjustments to them based on that feedback so that we can end up with an even stronger set of initiatives at the end of that. And then the last um, way in which we're relying on communities, and, and this I guess is the message I would hope to leave you with, is that um, we're dealing with a problem that's been evolving for decades and is going to continue to evolve for decades to come. And even if this were the first day of the first term of uh, this mayor's uh, time in office, we wouldn't be able to implement everything and solve all of these problems um, during one mayoralty. And that's especially true given that, in fact, it's not the first day of the first term. It's the last six months of the last term of this mayor. And we're really relying on community groups uh, to push the next mayoral administration, whoever that might be, um, to do some combination of, we hope, adopting a large number of the proposals that we have in here. But to the extent that they object to specific elements of this, um, we hope that community organizations will be pushing future administrations to say what their alternative is. Because it can't just be dismissive, because this is a problem that's too big. Um, and we can't afford not to do anything. So um, hopefully that answers uh, the questions, and I'll be happy to take other questions.
I'm going to look at our host. Um, how do you want to handle some time? OK, great. Well, we have 15 full minutes of, of questions. You know, I think it's interesting. Um, I think we're all well aware now of the sort of nuances of the storm, how it could have been worse, or not, maybe not quite as impactful. But I also think that that's true. So that point in time, you know, when, when Superstorm Sandy did come into our communities, um, to me, there's a, a very clear uh, sort of analogy to this point in time in government right now. I think we have unprecedented interagency cooperation happening. These guys were laughing in the green room together. They obviously know each other well. Um, but at the federal level, interagency task forces, um, and that's going down all the way to the communities. And I think that's you know, something to really seize uh, as we think about the solutions and how to continue this work going forward. So let's open it up. And um, if you raise your hand, we can repeat your question. Or is there a microphone? OK. Um, hi, thank you all for uh, excellent uh, overview on all of your work. I'm, uh, I should stand up, I guess. Uh, Judge Shackman, I'm a doctoral candidate at Rutgers Blaustein School as a fellow with uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The last two years uh, before Sandy, I was studying best practices in coastal resiliency um, <clears throat> from Maine to Virginia. And the report uh, also is going to be due out any day now. So I'll be glad to share it with you. Um, my question is about the difference between the state and the city's tactic specifically, I guess, Governor Cuomo and Mayor Bloomberg, um, that was elucidated in the report, the report, SAR report that came out. Um, the, the mayor clearly thinks that um, retreat is a very bad word. It's only mentioned in the report in negative terms and affirmatively states that we will not retreat, instead taking um, a much more uh, sort of proactive stance at building, um, building up protections at the coast, understandably in a very built up area. Um, you know, this makes quite a bit of sense. We're just wondering if, um, if Seth, you could elucidate exactly um, how, uh, how this position uh, is currently being seen by the governor. The governor obviously having said specifically that there are certain parcels that nature owns, et cetera, and that um, I was wondering how the CRZ process will intersect with the city's own plans and if the, if the governor really intends to sort of look more at nature-based solutions and where it might make sense to use innovative strategies to, um, to not rebuild. Thanks. And because we have limited time, Thanks. I'm going to ask, does anyone else have a sort of similar question that you want to just add on to that before we have it answered, just to make use of? Is there anything? S okay. Well, extending on that, uh, I would want to throw the time horizons in, because our short-term solutions or mid-term solutions could be liabilities in the long term. And often we should look way beyond what we can do right now to understand whether we create new liabilities. So 100, 200 years to look into the future with sea level rise and then see how that affects our current approach. So, so maybe if I, I can take uh, the second question and then um, begin the response to the first, and, and I'll allow Seth to, to finish that. Um, with respect to the time horizon, uh, we were very deliberate um, in our choice of a mid-century uh, out year for uh, our time horizon. There were a few reasons for that. One is that in talking to um, our climate scientist uh, uh, colleagues, um, what we saw was that the farther out in time you go, the larger the variance uh, there was in terms of the projections. And uh, if you go too far out, um, the variance is so wide that it's hard to know um, exactly what it is that you're planning for. That's number one. Number two is that in many ways, because this is a problem that will continue to evolve, if you were to try to solve the out year problems starting today, the resources that would be required in order to hit those out year levels rather than a midpoint are so great um, that you would end up being unable, in fact, to solve anything um, because uh, the, the resource requirement would drain whatever resources you have. The, the third thing, though, um, that I would say is that also if you look at many of the proposals that we're making, in fact, most of the proposals that we're making, they're proposals that relate to assets that have useful life, lives 
um, that are roughly equal uh, to or less than the periods over which we were looking. So the expectation is that as the assets that are being invested in through our plan begin to reach the end of their useful lives, that at that point, as they're replaced, um, that the people who are in charge at that point will be looking towards the next period of time and will make adjustments uh, accordingly. Um, with respect to the, the first question, um, I, I think that the, the difference in approach um, between the governor and the mayor is um, uh, a little less extreme than maybe the, the, um, uh, the question implies. Um, we are working very collaboratively with the state um, on the government's buyout, uh, the governor's got buyout plan. Um, the governor's plan uh, is relatively limited um, in New York City, um, and um, it, it is on offer to uh, the communities where uh, the governor that the governor has targeted, um, and we've been supportive in the one community that has come forward looking for a buyout, uh, which is in Oakwood Beach, um, in Staten Island. Um, I think what the the mayor has said is that um, although that is a, a tool in our toolkit, um, it, it is not going to solve the larger problem. Um, the, the fact is that we live in a city where today uh, over 500 million square feet of uh, buildings uh, are located in our 100-year floodplain. And as you play that floodplain into the future, you're looking at 800 million square feet. So. Uh, even if we thought that the right solution were retreat, which the mayor clearly doesn't, uh, just practically speaking, you're not going to be able to relocate 500 million square feet uh, uh, in any reasonable time horizon and within any reasonable expectation of resource availability. And so what we need to do is we need to say, how do we protect those 500 million square feet? How do we protect the people who live in these areas? Um, and th that is consistent with what the governor is doing uh, in other parts of his plan. Um, and by the way, the last thing that I would say is there was the, uh, the um, uh, distinction was made in the, in the question implicitly between what the mayor is proposing and, and natural defenses. Um, there actually isn't a distinction. Many of the defenses that the mayor is proposing uh, to protect the neighborhoods are in fact uh, reinforcing and, um, and preserving the natural defenses that either exist or once existed, whether it's uh, creating new wetlands um, or green uh, uh, blue belts and other green infrastructure or a whole host of, of additional strategies that the mayor has proposed in, in the plan. And I don't want to dwell too long because we want to get some other questions. So if you could be succinct. Yeah, the only other thing I would ask is that it would add is that in addition to this being um, somewhat unique in the level of cooperation among government, the other things that, that I think is unique in the way that all three levels of government have approached this is to, and which is unusual for government, and those of you who work with government know, is that it isn't a one size fits all approach. Um, you know, very often government comes in and says, this is going to be it, these are the rules, we're doing it, and, and it's the same for everybody. At every level of government, from Secretary Donovan to the governor and the mayor, which is reflected so wonderfully in the report, there has been a real effort to recognize that different communities in different areas and different, have different needs and there are different solutions depending on where you are for a whole host of reasons. And again, there are challenges in then implementing 100 different approaches, but I think every area of, rec of government recognizes that we have to do that because we have to address the very real differences in, in space needs, in uh, pre-existing conditions, in natural assets. And that has been, I think, one of the exciting parts of it for all of us is to come into it in a way that really gives us the flexibility and freedom to design what makes sense without being locked into a very small number of, of solutions. Thanks. All right, this is the final question, I believe. Um, so make it a good one. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, Tacumba and Jamie made a very interesting presentation today. I'm an affected resident of Staten Island. For the whole of my 64 years, given uh, the first year for collecting my thoughts, I've always feared that big ocean out there coming out to Staten Island and washing us all away. The facts that Tacumba and Jamie presented to the audience here today 
were known for years. Mr. Pinsky, I've been a very vocal critic of Sir because I felt it was too much public relations and not enough accountability. The people in the working class community were, I got washed out in Midland Beach, Ocean Breeze, are beside themselves still, seven and a half months later, not knowing where their lives are gonna go from here. Up and down, left and right, FEMA to rapid response, elevate your buildings. What about us? We look at the powerful and say, weren't you supposed to be responsible for protecting us? The first time I went to the CYO SIR meeting, that's the first question I asked. Where is the investigation? What did OEM do? What did the police do? What did the fire department do? What did the Coast Guard do? What did your boss's office do? We need that accountability. The people in Staten Island were our first line of defense. We helped out each other. We swam through those waters. We saved those people. Unfortunately, we couldn't save Glenda Moore's two boys, Brendan and Connor, two and four years old, or Patricia Dress's daughter, who fell out of her arms as their little house collapsed in Tottenville. We need answers, and I expect to ask each and every candidate for the new mayor, what are you going to do to give us those answers, make people responsible, and make sure that that big ocean out there doesn't gobble up any other people? Thank you. Um, so obviously, uh, I am uh, incredibly sympathetic to the, the loss that you and your neighbors suffered. I've spent a lot of time in Staten Island and other impacted communities and heard many stories like yours. Um, and I know that in many ways what happened on the East Shore, especially of Staten Island, um, was uh, uh, of a different order of magnitude than what happened anywhere else in the city. And in fact, you're right. Uh, the areas that you've lived in have been vulnerable for decades. Um, and um, there have been studies that have been started, uh, studies that have been started by the Army Corps of Engineers and others that went on and on and investments weren't made. And um, uh, what I can say to you um, without being able really to talk about uh, why studies uh, didn't turn to implementation uh, simply because I, I wasn't around uh, and looking at these issues uh, during that period, what I can say is that moving forward, uh, there is a strong commitment on the part of the city, um, especially to protect the east shore of Staten Island. And in fact, um, in the supplemental appropriation that was passed by Congress um, and signed by the president, um, which is of an unprecedented scale and, and brings finally uh, real resources to the region to help not just with rebuilding but also with resiliency, uh, an important part of that supplemental appropriation is funding that will enable the Army Corps of Engineers at last to finish the study that they started in the 1990s with respect to the protection of the East Shore and money to actually implement that project. That will then require a state match of funds and a city match of funds. And one of the things that's in this report that the mayor said in his speech uh, when he uh, unveiled the plan was that we are putting the 50 or so million dollars in city funding that will be needed to ensure that that project happens as soon as possible into the capital budget this year, the budget that will be passed in the next several days. Um, and uh, as soon as the Army Corps is done with that uh, study, which I think expectations are that that will be uh, completed uh, in a relatively short period of time, our expectation is that they will begin construction of a major coastal defense along the East Shore that I think, had it been in place uh, during Sandy, would have led to a very different set of uh, outcomes uh, on the East Shore. And it's absolutely uh, the responsibility of everyone that you see here um, and all of us as a city to ensure that going forward, uh, we're protecting those very vulnerable communities. So uh, do we have a few couple minutes? I'll Go ahead, you can conclude. Okay, <laughs> oh, I didn't intend to do that. No, that's okay. okay. I mean, conclude this question. Okay, yeah. um, so a couple of things. I clearly uh, echo anything that Seth said um, as far as um, you know, our, this, the understanding of what happened on Staten Island. We also have been out in Staten Island, not nearly as much as Seth has, but, but we have been out there, and, and the Secretary has been out there a couple of times since he was appointed. Um, I would say a couple of things. One is, unfortunately, and this is not going to be satisfying to hear, it's actually too early, I think, to know um, whether 
the, whether something is different this time around. Seth is obviously right that um, whatever the failings were, um, clearly the known was, you know, there was a lot that was known and not acted on. Um, and while everybody appears to have a much greater understanding of what's going on now, it's too soon to know whether we're going to act on it the right way. Um, so when we're all back here next year or, or whenever the next, you know, the next set of forums are uh, a year from now and wherever they are, um, that's going to be what the discussion should focus on. It's, you know, if it's happened, let's talk about what's happened and what more needs to happen. If it hasn't happened, then I think you need to start, um, you know, honestly take out the pitchforks and start asking serious questions about why not, because at that point it's not too late. Um, uh, you know, you'll have much greater clarity on what the, the core study looks like. You'll have a lot more understanding of what the money, how the money has been spent in places like Staten Island. And, um, and I know, at least in our task force, the federal government and the state and city, there's a real commitment to transparency and accountability. So there won't be any mystery about where that money got spent. Um, and if it wasn't spent somewhere, why it wasn't. And you'll be able to ask all those questions. Um, I will say that there is um, one, one last point. There are, you know, there are, um, and, and we've been dealing with this for the last seven months, in addition to the three levels of government here and the most local levels, um, there's all kinds of other players who are deeply invested um, in, the, in having this recovery go successfully. You know, Senator Schumer has been um, obviously a leader in the effort. Senator Gillibrand's office and Senator Gillibrand have been leaders and many members of the delegation, the congressional delegation, but also the more local. Um, those are folks that you need to engage in this discussion, and obviously they're not here, but they are an active part of it going forward, whether it's because you need more money from the legislature um, to, to really fully build out all these plans or just, frankly, to keep the pressure on, and I won't be here, so it's, I'm happy to say this, to keep the pressure on the federal government. Government, um, to do what it says it's going to do. So um, don't forget about those folks. Senator Schumer, in particular, is a um, is a uh, has a very very deep track record in keeping pressure on people to do things. The core study is his priority. Um, I know he's going to make sure they do it on time. But there's also a whole wha a whole range of other things that he takes very seriously. So those are folks you got to bring into this discussion. Terrific. That's a great place to end. I think we all do have a uh, responsibility to hold our leaders accountable as well as ourselves um, as we leave the room to figure out how to keep the pressure on. If we heard anything, it was that this report is a framework. It's not the end. Uh, so much, much work ahead of us. So we all uh, will remain accountable and keep our leadership accountable as well. So I'll hand it back over to you, Mary. Thank you. So as we always say, you know, it's uh, we're, we at MES talk about resilience being an all hands on deck, all the time process. So we always say we'll see you soon. It, this isn't over. Sorry, Jamie, it won't be a year. We'll see you soon. I think in a shorter period of time than that. Um, thanks to SIR and the team for giving us so much time today. And for, we, we now need to go and really uh, read the report in detail. And we look forward to the federal report on the 2nd of August, or I gather the 5th, since you're sequestered on the 2nd. Something like that. Apparently. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have a busy summer. Uh, thank you to Dana. Thank Thank you to Seth a Diamond. Welcome into your new job. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll see you soon. Uh, thanks very much.